we are in trouble or distress, that he brings the word of comfort and the word of grace to us. What a blessing to have a faithful pastor continue to use him and strengthen us through his work that we may be encouraged and strengthened by the word, that glorious word of truth. And grant a blessing upon the elders as they oversee his labor, and as they themselves are as watchmen on the towers of Zion who must warn and exhort us, and whose very lives must be testimonies to the power of thy grace. Use them in the midst of the congregation for the good of thy saints here. But bless also the deacons in their labors. Give them wisdom. Give them the necessary mercy. That as they have experienced the mercies of Jesus Christ, they are able to bring that to those who have need. To comfort them and to assist them in their troubles. So that in all these things we have the work of Jesus Christ working through the office of deacon as a merciful and faithful high priest. Through the office of elder as a powerful king who defends and preserves his church in the midst of this wicked world. Who fights for us and rules over us. And as a prophet through the office of minister who proclaims the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. A gospel indeed that is despised, a gospel that men reject and that we reject in the power of our, in our own strength, but a powerful gospel nonetheless that thou dost use to build up the church. Gather thy church out of all nations, send forth the word of the gospel. We rejoice with Wingham today that they have a pastor. Continue, Lord, to bless them and Unite now pastor and wife and children with the congregation so that the word goes forth with boldness and that the people there are built up in the truth and that it can go forth also as they are zealous to send forth the glorious gospel of sovereign grace and the unconditional covenant. Use them mightily in that place to proclaim that glorious truth. And give us men who are equipped by the Spirit we pray for the, del- for the young men who are being trained and who will soon face their exam before Senate. Use the instruction that they've been receiving to equip them to be faithful in their work, to be zealous for the truth, to be instruments in the hand of Jesus Christ to proclaim with boldness the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, continue to give us men. If it be thy will also from this congregation that there may be those who are are called, convicted by the Holy Spirit who must enter the seminary and must pursue the gospel ministry so that we have preachers, men who can go in and out among the churches and proclaim the gospel. Lord, preserve us and give us faithful men and preserve, preserve the ministers that we have in faithfulness, in godliness, in the truth, so that their lives also reflect the glorious gospel that they preach. Hear us in mercy. Forgive all our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. We worship the Lord in the giving of our offerings. The first collection is for domestic missions. And the second collection is for the Free Christian School of Edgerton, Minnesota.
Soldier number 337. 337 speaks of the proclamation of the word. Thy wondrous testimonies, Lord, my soul will keep and greatly praise thy word by faithful lips proclaim to simplest minds the truth conveys. All the stanzas, 337. Our scripture reading this evening is Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah 53. <coughs> Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. 
Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. So far we read God's holy word. The text for the sermon tonight is verse 1. Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the chapter that we read, Isaiah 53, is the gospel. It is the good news of salvation. It really contains everything of the truth of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished. It speaks of his suffering, his death, his resurrection, and even his exaltation to glory. It begins with his lowly birth, that he will grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground, having no form or comeliness, pointing to his lowly birth there in Bethlehem. It speaks of his death on the cross as a substitutionary death, that he died for others in, chapter, in verses 3 through 6. It speaks of his silent suffering, of the mistreatment of the ungodly who tried him and who beat him and the, un, and the godless authorities in verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. His death is recorded in verse 8, that he was cut off out of the land of the living. His burial is recorded in verse 9, that he made his grave with the wicked. And there's a hint of the resurrection, that he was buried with the rich in his death, pointing to the fact that he was to come out of that and to be exalted by God's right hand. What he accomplished is set forth in verse 10, that he saved his seed. And verse 11, that he justified many. And then verse 12, that he will divide a portion with the great and divide the spoil with the strong. His exaltation is set forth. Everything that our Lord Jesus Christ accomplished is set forth in Isaiah 53. A gospel of a crucified Lord and a risen Lord and exalted Lord. This is the gospel so clear that it's almost as if Isaiah stands on the other side of the cross and looks back at what the Lord has done and describes it in the language that we have here. The whole Old Testament, of course, pointed ahead to Jesus Christ. But this is the most vivid description of all that Jesus did. Most of the things are described in terms of types and shadows but here we have a description in vivid language. This is a gospel that Isaiah preached to the people of God, obviously near to the end of the Old Testament age, relatively speaking. These were evil days. When Isaiah prophesied, the people of God in Judah were living in idolatry, they were violating all the commandments of God. Though they pretended that they still worshipped God and they would bring their offerings to the Lord, there was no sincerity in it. And Isaiah was sent to rebuke the people of God, to call them to repentance. He would sound dreadful words of judgment that the Lord was coming in wrath against his people and that the bondage of the captivity was coming upon them. Repent, he said. 
But the purpose of God in sending Isaiah was a, a most unpleasant thing for a minister to have to do because God sent Isaiah with this mission. Harden their hearts, close their ears, shut their eyes, so that I will judge this people because they will not hear you, they will not repent, and I will bring them to their captivity. So the first 39 chapters of Isaiah are exactly that, a word of judgment, a word of rebuke that Isaiah brings to the church. But from chapter 40 on, the tone changes. Immediately in chapter 40, Isaiah says, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. Because now from chapter 40 to the end of the book, Isaiah takes the standpoint now of looking at the captives who are in Jerusalem, even though, or who are in Babylon rather, even though they haven't been carried off yet. That captivity would not come until the prophecy of Jeremiah, the end of Jeremiah, but it's as if the captivity is so real that God wants to speak a word of comfort to the captives. And so in the midst of that, imagine the people of God in captivity, that they are languishing there in captivity, and Isaiah speaks this word, for their comfort, the word of the gospel, and a word concerning the arm of the Lord. The passage certainly is appropriate for this season of the year when we commemorate the suffering and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The text we consider is an introduction to the whole of the gospel and it brings out the amazing, the astounding fact that though the gospel is so glorious, though the gospel is a, a revelation of the salvation of Jesus in Jesus Christ, few there are who believe it. And that was true in Isaiah's day. That's been true all through history. And it's true today too. Who hath believed our report, he asks, and we can ask the same. Let's consider this verse under the theme, Believing the Prophet's Report. Believing the Prophet's Report. Well, notice in the first place the glorious content. What was he preaching? Secondly, the authoritative proclamation that he would bring a, a proclamation with authority to the people of God. And then thirdly, the indispensable faith. The necessity of faith to believe this report. Believing the prophet's report, the glorious content, the authoritative proclamation, and the indispensable faith. The content is the arm of the Lord. Who hath believed our report, he says, and to whom is the arm of the Lord Reveal. That's the, the content of his preaching. Now, what is that? The arm of Jehovah, literally, because you see that the word Lord is in capital letters, so it's the arm of Jehovah. And as soon as you hear that, you understand that that's a figure of speech. There's a picture there that Isaiah wants us to recognize because God does not have a body a physical body, and God does not therefore have an arm. And yet he speaks of the arm of Jehovah because he wants us to think about our arm. And the emphasis, first of all, then on the arm of Jehovah is it is pointing to the tremendous power of God. Now that's something that all the little boys of the congregation can understand very, very clearly. Because when someone says, are you strong? What does a little boy immediately do? He takes out his arm and he says, yes, feel my muscles. The arm represents the power of an individual to accomplish something. And when Isaiah speaks of the arm of Jehovah, he's emphasizing God's power. In fact, there is a place in the psalm, Psalm 79, verse 11, 
where God, where the translators even translated the word arm as power. Isaiah 79 says, Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee, according to the greatness of thy power, literally thy arm, preserve those who are appointed to die. That's God's mighty power. But the, it is not merely the power to, the, the raw power of God, so to speak, but it's the power of God to accomplish something. Because when you want to do something, you use your arm and your hand to perform that which you want to do. And that's what God has in mind here too. In Deuteronomy 9, 29, for example, you read this. Yet thy, they thy people and thy, they are thy people in thine inheritance, which thou broughtest out, now notice, with thy mighty power and with thy stretched out arm. The stretched out arm indicates that a person is trying to accomplish something. He's using his power and his ability to perform a certain work. Taking Israel out of Egypt. By this arm, God performed wonders. Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, said Jeremiah, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and thy stretched out arm. The power of God, the arm of God created the heavens and the earth. And he says, there is nothing too hard for thee. So the arm of God is his power. The arm of God is that by which he accomplishes his will. He carries out his activities. But the arm of God is especially the power of God to save. That's especially where God holds out his arm. And he wants his people to notice his tremendous power to save them. Israel, as we read in Deuteronomy 9, was delivered from Israel by the stretched out arm of God. You'll find that a number of times in the Old Testament, that figure of speech. He fought for them against the Canaanites with his mighty arm. He defended them against the Assyrians in Hezekiah's day with his powerful arm. <laughs> He would later on deliver them out of their captivity of Babylon with his powerful arm. Isaiah 32 verse 2 says this, Be thou their arm every morning, and their salvation also in the time of trouble. Be their arm every day, he says to them, to God, and their salvation in time of of trouble. That's what God's arm does. It saves. And therefore, God clearly has in mind that that arm of Jehovah represents Jesus Christ. Because Jesus, as the second person of the Trinity who becomes flesh, God does everything that he determines to do through Jesus Christ. He created all things by the Word who is Jesus Christ. He works His providence by His Word which is Jesus Christ. Everything God wants to do, He accomplishes through His arm, through Jesus Christ. In fact, in Isaiah 52, the preceding chapter, verse 10, we read this. God hath made bare his arm. Once again, revealed it. He has stripped off the clothes, so to speak, and revealed his arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall, shall see the salvation of our God. That's who Jesus is. Jehovah, salvation. He is God's salvation. He is the mighty arm of Jehovah God. 
Isaiah 53 indicates, therefore, that the promised Messiah Christ is God. He is God. Even though in Isaiah 53, verse 10, he is referred to, or rather verse 11, he is referred to as my righteous servant. He's referred to as a servant of Jehovah. Yet he is not a servant who is a mere man that God calls and says, now you will be my servant to do my will. But he is the servant of God who is also very God. Just as your arm is part of you, so Jesus, God's salvation, is, if I may put it that way, He's part of God. He is God. Jesus is very God. This is one of the places in the Bible that indicates that the Messiah that God would bring to save His people was not a mere man. But he was God himself. God would save his people through the, the seed of the woman. Through that Messiah. He had divine power. He had divine glory. He was to be worshipped. We may never worship a mere man. But God would call his people to worship the Son. To worship the Messiah. Because he is very God. When Jesus in his trial under oath was asked whether he was the Christ and Jesus replied that in fact he was the Christ then they said he has spoken blasphemy why because they understood that the Christ was very God very God he is therefore the powerful servant of God the one in and through whom God determined to save his people completely unto himself. To save them not merely by delivering them out of the bondage of Egypt or delivering them from the hand of the Canaanites or the Babylonians. That's part of the salvation of the people to deliver them from the enemies that afflicted them time after time in the history of the Old Testament church. But the true and eternal salvation was deliverance from their spiritual enemies. Deliverance from the bondage of sin. Deliverance from the dreadful punishment that Israel and that we deserve. Namely, God's eternal wrath and hell and the bondage of sin. To free them from sin and to give them life and to give them joy. That's what this arm of Jehovah would accomplish. But as God reveals here in this text, in this chapter, the manner, the way in which God would accomplish it in and through His arm was the way of humiliation, the way of suffering unto death. He would endure the wrath of God against His people and pay for that wrath. And in this way would be the powerful arm of God that would deliver His people from their sin. That then is the content of this report that Isaiah talks about. The glorious message of salvation, the gospel of Jesus Christ. A gospel that is powerful, a gospel that reveals that salvation is not something that might happen, not a salvation that depends on Israel or depends on some other mighty deliverer of men, but a mighty salvation that depends upon God Himself. I will accomplish by my right arm, my arm, the salvation of the people. This is what Isaiah brought to Israel in their captivity. As they languished in Babylon. As they longed to be delivered and brought back to Jerusalem. And be able to worship God once again in the tabernacle, in the temple. The word of God says your salvation is sure by the arm of Jehovah. He didn't hold out some hope of some human deliverer. 
God himself, the sovereign power of God, remember by that arm he created the heavens and the earth. By that arm he had delivered Israel out of the land of Egypt, out of the bondage of Egypt, and defeated their enemies. And he would save his people. That's the gospel that Isaiah was proclaiming. This is a gospel that has been proclaimed throughout all the ages. It really started already in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve fell and God came and said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and that woman and between thy seed and her seed, her seed, one that would come from her and said, God, that seed will crush the head of the serpent. There's the message of salvation. The powerful seed would crush the head of the serpent. God would save his people. God is absolutely sovereign. God saves powerfully his people. Man adds nothing to that. Man does not claim anything, not, not, does not even have the ability to add anything to that salvation. It's all of grace. So that the gospel that God has caused to be proclaimed in Isaiah's day all the way to the present day is a gospel of sovereign, irresistible grace. God doesn't ask man if he may save him. God simply saves. God doesn't ask if he wants to be saved. God has chosen his people in all eternity, not because there was something in that man or that woman that was worthy to be saved, but simply because God determined. He chose them to be his people. He justifies them in the blood of Jesus Christ without any works that man can add. And God establishes his covenant. The gospel of sovereign grace is the gospel of the covenant that God says, I choose you to be my people and I bring you into my covenant. An unconditional covenant is what the gospel preaches where God establishes His covenant with His people in Jesus Christ, His chosen people. He maintains that covenant with His people and with believers and their seed. And the promise of the covenant, as the promise of the gospel, is particular. But it's certain, because it doesn't depend on us. When God promises salvation, it's a powerful, sure deliverance that God accomplishes. That's the gospel. The gospel that Isaiah was preaching. The arm of Jehovah is a sovereign, irresistible grace. And that's the gospel that is preached even to today. But who would believe it? Isaiah asks a question. Who hath believed our report. And you understand when Isaiah asks that, he's not asking for a show of hands. How many people here believe it? It's not curiosity that causes him to ask it. He is astounded by something. He is amazed. There's hardly anyone who believes it. It's a cry of dismay. It's a cry of utter sorrow that he brings when he says, Who hath believed our report? It's a rhetorical question which is indicating that there are very few that believe. Here he comes with this glorious gospel. Here he comes with the right arm of God exposed so that everyone can see this is the power that will deliver you. This is the only power that can deliver you. And he comes with the gospel. And hardly anyone believes the report. Hardly anyone. That's his utter amazement. What makes it even worse is that Isaiah comes with an authoritative proclamation. 
word that is proclaimed is, in this report is, is a report through a prophet. What is a prophet? A prophet is a man called by God, set apart from the rest of the people by God, clearly identified as a prophet. God would anoint a prophet, a man to be a prophet, with oil, indicating the fact that the Spirit had separated him and qualified him to be someone that could fill this office of God. And when he became a prophet, he became at that point an official spokesman for God. A spokesman for God. He spoke with the authority of God. That, first of all. In addition to that, the very word prophet comes from a word which means to boil over. That a man boiled over, so to speak, with the word of God. It indicated that as a prophet, he's, as that official, set-apart spokesman of God... He would receive a revelation from God. He would receive a word directly from God himself. That's his report. Literally, who hath believed that which was heard. In other words, he's talking about what he heard as a prophet. And he had not heard some rumor that he now said, I'm going to tell you the story I heard here. But what he had heard was the word directly from God himself. God gave him a word to speak. So he didn't bring his own word. He didn't bring the word of his neighbor. He brought a word that God gave him to speak. And that word in the prophet was something that he could not hold in. There were times in the Old Testament, when the prophets would be given a word from God, and it was a word of such dreadful judgment that they didn't want to speak it. They didn't want to speak it because it was telling their friends and their relatives and the very people of God, God is coming to destroy you. Your wives will be killed and your children will be killed and they will take your babies and throw them over the walls to the rocks below. How would you like to come and say that to the people of God? If I had to, as a prophet, stand here in the pulpit and say, God is coming to kill you because of your sin. They didn't want to say that. But they couldn't keep it in. That's the idea of boiling over. The word that God would put into the prophet was something that would just be so powerful within him, such a burden on his soul, that as a pot that has water in it that is heated, and finally the water boils over the top of the pot, the word that God gave the prophet had to come out. And if he was a true prophet of God, then the people that heard him understood that. This was a man set apart from God who came not with his own word, but with the very word of God. They understood that. That's what the preaching is too, you understand. The preaching today is the means that God uses to proclaim the gospel of Isaiah 53 and the whole of the scriptures. It's an authoritative proclamation of the word of God by a man that is called by Jesus Christ. And, and we don't just let anyone come into the pulpit, but someone who is called by the church. And when the church calls, we, we see there that he's a man set apart by Jesus Christ to be a spokesman of Jesus Christ. And the word that he brings is not his own word. He searches the scriptures. He doesn't get new revelations as they did in the Old Testament. That's the difference between a prophet and a preacher. But he searches the scriptures and he, he comes with this word. And when he stands in the pulpit as a representative of Jesus Christ with the authority of Christ, and he brings a word in harmony with the Bible, you understand Christ is speaking. 
This is the word of Jesus Christ that we hear testifying of himself and of his glorious work of salvation. The preaching has authority. It has an authority so that when a man says, now look, this is what the word of God says. No one may simply dismiss that. No one may say, well, that's just your opinion. He's bringing the word of God and he's coming with the authority of Jesus Christ. And when he says to you, you have to believe this and you must obey this. That's the kind of authority that God uses to bring this report, this word of God. By means of this official, authoritative proclamation, the word, that rather the arm of, Jeho of Jehovah is revealed. Now the striking thing about it is that the arm of Jehovah is always revealed in all its power exactly by having it be revealed in the context of the weakness of man. That's what makes it all the more glorious. When is the arm of God revealed to Israel of old? It's when Israel is in bondage in Egypt. They're slaves. And the most powerful nation on the earth, with all its arms, with soldiers and chariots, can snuff out Israel in a moment if they want to. They have Israel by the throat. Israel cannot do one thing. But that's when the arm of Jehovah came and delivered them from their bondage. It's when they stood before the Canaanites and they themselves were afraid the Canaanites were far greater in number. They were armed to the teeth. They had high-walled cities. And here comes Israel to fight against them. We cannot possibly take the land. But the arm of the Lord thrust out the Canaanites in front of them and gave them the land. It's when Sennacherib came with a 100,000 soldiers and surrounded Jerusalem, and Jerusalem didn't have anybody to fight. Sennacherib mocked them and said, I'll give you 2,000 2, horses if you can put soldiers on them to fight against me. I'll give you the horses. And Israel couldn't even come up with that. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of soldiers but it was the hand, the arm of God that gave them deliverance. The same thing is true in the preaching of the gospel. The preaching comes in the context of our inability, our helplessness to be able to save ourselves. The preaching comes, first of all, with this message. Who are you? You are a people depraved. You are a people dead in sin. You are a people that cannot do anything to save yourselves. You are a people on your way to eternal destruction and wrath. That's what you deserve, and that's where you're going. And you cannot possibly do one thing to save yourselves. You cannot lift up the hand and say, I want to be saved. You cannot say, well, here's a work. Maybe this will contribute to my salvation. The gospel comes with a message. You are helpless, absolutely helpless. And your situation is hopeless. You cannot save yourself. That's when the arm of Jehovah is revealed. That's when God says, but there is salvation. God has provided salvation through his mighty arm. When that message comes, whether it's to Israel in a typical way as they are in bondage in Egypt, or whether it comes to us in our sinfulness, clearly the arm of Jehovah stands out in its glory and in its power. No one can miss it. No flesh can glory in God's sight. No one can say, ah, yes, well, the arm of God is quite something, all right, but so am I. I'm powerful, and I contribute to the salvation. No one. And yet, 
Though the report comes in the preaching of the gospel concerning the glorious arm of God, almost no one believes it. Who hath believed our report, says Isaiah, in utter astonishment? Why didn't they believe it? Was Isaiah a poor preacher? Was his speech contemptible and confusing and no one could understand what he was talking about? That's not the reason. It's rather this. Man never believes the gospel. He never wants it. He never believes it. Not in his strength. From the very beginning of the world, that's the way it was. Enoch, mighty preacher of, to the people of his day, preached of the judgment of God to come. What did they do? They tried to kill him, and God delivered him out of the earth. Noah, building the ark and warning people for 120 years of the judgment to come. And what did they do? They mocked him, and they went to their death in the flood. Moses, who brought the people the word, God sent me to deliver you. God has come to take you out of the bondage. And the people didn't even want to hear it. They said, you're causing more trouble than it's worth. Please leave us alone. And Isaiah, when he brought the word to the people of Israel of the mighty power of God and had fire come down from heaven and showed that power that would burn up the sacrifice surrounded by water, finally said, I give up. Nobody believes. Nobody wants to hear about it. So also Jesus, the chief prophet and teacher. He came into Israel and brought them the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of salvation. And his own people rejected him. Jerusalem finally took him and crucified him. His own disciple Peter denied him and his disciples forsook him. They were offended at him. After three and a half years of publicly proclaiming the message of salvation and demonstrating his mighty power to do so by his astounding miracles, raising people from the dead, cleansing the lepers and all the miracles that he could do, he had just a a couple of handfuls of followers, that's all he had, who believed the report. John 12 explains that. We read, though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. And then notice this, that the saying of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? The text we consider tonight is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They didn't believe him either. He was the arm. He was revealing the mighty power to save. And they didn't want it. And they don't want it today either. Men do not desire the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. They don't want a Christ that is crucified. That's the holy arm of God. That arm says to them they are hopeless that they cannot save themselves. That's a, a message that offends them. They don't want to be told that. It tells them that they can do absolutely nothing to contribute to their salvation. Besides that, they really aren't interested in being saved from sin. They love their sins. What they want to be saved from is the consequences of their sin. Their poverty, their wretchedness, the misery of this life. Can you do away with the sicknesses and the troubles of this life? Save us from that. That's the kind of Savior they want. They don't want a Savior that comes 
and is nailed to the cross. They're not interested in someone that will deliver them from the sins that they commit. They want a glorious Savior that will come and say, I will deliver you. I'll give you peace and prosperity. That's the kind of Savior that they want. Give them a gospel that gives power to man. Give them a gospel that says you can do something. You can create a heaven here on earth. You can take care of the evils of this society and have a society finally where there is peace and riches and prosperity. That's the society you can build yourself. That kind of gospel, well, they'll fill the auditorium. They'll fill the size of this auditorium a hundred times over because that's the kind of gospel that man wants, but not this one. And that's been the experience right to today. There is nothing more beautiful to me than the Reformed faith that God sovereignly chooses His people in all eternity whom He has loved. And that He t determines to draw them unto Himself with an unconditional covenant and to save them in the blood of Jesus Christ with a salvation which means those people cannot be lost. And the promises of God are absolutely certain because He accomplishes the, pro the promises. They don't depend on us. What a beautiful gospel. But men don't want it. The report is despised. <coughs> Men are offended at that. And they're offended not only because they don't want that kind of a Savior, but listen to the description of that Savior. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we, we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's not that glorious Savior that men want. He's meek, and he's lowly, and he's despised, and he's finally nailed to a cross. And they want nothing of that. That's the offense of the cross. Number one, that you have to have a Savior that will save you from your sins. And secondly, that he's that kind of a Savior who will be crucified. People don't want that. I don't want that. You don't want that. Not as we are by nature. We don't want that. We want something that praises us. We want something that will give us some credit. No, it takes faith. That's the only thing that will enable anyone to believe the report of Isaiah. Man doesn't have any faith in himself. He's totally depraved. He loves what is sinful. He loves sin and he loves his own personal <coughs> lusts. He will satisfy his own desires and he hates God because God is holy. And so when God comes even with the gospel which says that God is God and he must be served and the possibility even of living with God, man doesn't want that. He wants a heaven here. He wants to enjoy the things of this earth. He doesn't care to live with God. Because he hates God. It's faith. God's gift of faith that makes all the difference. And that too is not man's work. That too is God's work. It's all of grace. God gives that faith to His chosen people. We, we confess in the canons that faith is a fruit of election. It is to the elect and to them alone and to every one of the elect that God works this powerful work of faith in them. And by faith we are grafted into Jesus Christ and by faith we take hold of the Scriptures and now what was to us a personal offense becomes for us a most glorious gospel that we are saved through the blood of Jesus Christ by the right arm of God. We live out of that. We put our trust in that one to save us. We believe the report. The text makes that plain that it's the work of God when it says specifically 
And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? It, it indicates that someone has to reveal the arm to someone. Before they can possibly believe the report, God must reveal the uh, arm to them. Now, whenever the Bible speaks of revelation, it's a, it's a work of God and it has two parts. The work of God revealing Jesus Christ is first of all the proclamation of that gospel. It sets forth Christ crucified. That's what the gospel does. The word goes out. Many people hear it. It informs them. It teaches them about God. And it teaches them about the Savior Jesus Christ. The external preaching of the gospel is part of the revealing of the arm. But most reject that. But the second part of the revelation is that God causes the blind to see it. He opens up the ears that are closed so that the gospel enters in. He causes the heart that is a rock, a stone cold heart. He causes that heart to be soft, to be pliable. And he causes the word, therefore, to enter into that heart. The revelation is set forth in the preaching of the gospel. But the other part of the revealing is that God works that work in us. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed indicates that they have had it revealed to them within their own hearts and souls. That's a work of God. Jesus, after the upbraiding the cities of Galilee, wherein he had done most of his work, said at that time, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. The word goes forth, but as the proclamation goes out, even with the authority of God behind it, even with the revelation of the glorious Savior in it, most men will not believe because their eyes are closed to it. It hardens their heart. God does not reveal it to them. It's to the babes that God reveals His truth. That's part of the powerful arm performing the work of salvation. It's mighty. It casts down the walls of resistance. It breaks the hard heart, and it causes us to believe the gospel. That some do believe is therefore a wonder of grace. Do you believe? Do you believe the report of Isaiah? When you look at that crucified Jesus, Hanging there on the cross. Do you see not a man who was broken? A man who was defeated? A man who gave up his life for a cause? But a Savior. The arm of the Lord is revealed there in all its power in the cross. As he paid for your sins. As he accomplished salvation. Do you believe that? Then you rejoice. Rejoice that God has revealed that to you. Revealed that He has given you the faith to take hold of that. And rejoice in such a glorious salvation that God has accomplished through His arm. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy glorious work of salvation. It is a work to which nothing is added, nothing can be. Surely we understand that tonight, that we have done nothing, but the glorious work of salvation is all of Thee, and we rejoice in that. That makes it secure. That makes it for us something we can be absolutely certain of.
And one day that mighty power of God will be revealed when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. He will be on the clouds of heaven. He is exalted now and he's coming. Lord, hasten that day. Thy mighty power is revealed, and all men must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. In, his, in Jesus' name alone do we pray this. Amen. Three hundred twenty. Psalter number three hundred twenty. What wondrous things the Lord has wrought in stanza three. The stone the builders set at naught, established by no human hand, the chiefest cornerstone doth stand. All the stanzas, 320. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.